Welcome back. I had somebody on my YouTube channel ask me, would you please finish the story? You told the story about leaving the ashram. Would you talk about leaving Yogananda and picking up training with Ashok Singh? Absolutely. Let's get into it. When you bring an idea from a yogic culture where it grew and where it thrives, and then you bring it to the West, there are going to be shifts and misunderstandings. And one of those misunderstandings is this overwhelming attachment to the Guru. The Guru is a very big deal in India and looking up to your mentor is a very, very big deal. But the idea that you can have only one great, fantastic mentor in your life and you must absolutely be devoted only to them for your entire life, this is more of a Western religious ethic than it is a yogic ethic. I often like to give the example of a martial art. If you're going to study a martial art, you ought to find a very good one. So if you go down the street and it says karate on the sign and you go, oh, well, this must be it. Well, you've, you've kind of found, you know, a McDonald's martial art. It's everywhere. It's very prolific and it's going to give you a little bit of sustenance, but it's not going to give you that much. It's not a beautiful homemade meal. So when you're a discerning connoisseur of martial arts, you're going to look for something a little bit more in depth. You're going to look for something deep. You're going to eventually look for a family system that has been handed down generation by generation by generation. And that's how you know, I've got something real. I've got a home cooked meal here. We're not talking fast food for the general public. This is something delicious and real and made and preserved with love. Now, when you pick that martial art, you need to dedicate yourself to it for some time. You have to invest yourself. If you only make a cursory investigation, you're not really going to be able to understand what the martial art is trying to give you. Same thing with anything that you study ever, right? If we make a very, very cursory perusal of what it is, we're not going to pull all the depths out of that training. So when you sit to train with somebody in a Kriya lineage, you have to give them a little bit of your time in order to pull a little bit of what it is that they have to offer. So you have to dedicate yourself to it for a span of time. That doesn't mean you're not going to fall by another teaching and it will give you no value. That would mean that your mind is very closed. So you might pick something up from Buddhism. You might pick something up from Taoism. You might pick something up from Christianity. And you might say, oh my goodness, I see where this falls in line with what my teacher has been telling me. And so I must be reaching this level of the big idea because as I keep expanding, I start seeing more and more parallels. So I was cramped down into one little system and, and that's all I could see. But as I keep expanding and going up closer and closer to the very, very big idea of the divine, as I chunk up my understanding, then I'm going to get a bigger picture and I'm going to see more and more and more parallels within these different systems. And I can learn from the terminology of another system to tell me more about my own system. And so you'll often see me here. I'll reference Buddhism. I'll reference Christianity. I will reference Huna. And I will turn around and look back at my own system and show it to you through the eyes of a completely different system. Why? Because they spent more time with that one principle. And for whatever reason, it crystallized just a little more beautifully 
and it just happens to be a little bit easier to pick up. The way that they phrased it, the way that they encapsulated the knowledge, Hakala, it's there in yoga. It's all over inside of yoga. It's all over inside of Vedanta. But the kahuna turned it into one little encapsulated meditation you can practice all day. You can walk around the office all day and practice Hakala. That's amazing to me because now you've taken something which is a very difficult part of the brain to get in touch with and you've turned it into something potentially explosive in your life, in your meditation. So it's very, very valuable. So you might dedicate yourself to one system, but then you might find that other systems speak to you. And that can be a core learning of your own system. Oh my God, here was this little thing and this other system, they blew it up. Soon after I started this YouTube channel, I had a wonderful yogi call me up from Canada. And he had gone on this amazing journey of learning Ketchari in India. He went from guru to guru and some said they knew and they didn't, some knew and wouldn't say. And finally he found the coolest cat Indian guru you could ever meet. He was just so cool and so laid back that it kind of worried this yogi that this is so strange. He should be acting a little bit pompous, he thought, right? It was somewhere in his mind he should be acting a little more grandiose, and yet he was so down to earth and so simple and so clear and so laid back that it, it was kind of a disconcerting to this yogi. And when he told me that, I'm like, oh, this, this guy's for real. This guy's for real. You found a real person. You found a real yogi. That's amazing. And this guru gave him an entire Ketri lineage. And this yogi called me up and he says, I have to give this to you. I have to give you this diksha. And he gave it to me over the phone. And I was reading one of a little snippet from a book from Sri M and he describes going up into the hills and he would meet one holy man and he would meet another holy man. He'd meet another, another holy man. And they would all say, wait, let me, let me give you this diksha before you go. I have to give this to you. So when you meet these wonderful deep yogis and you create this little bit of friendship, there's this give and take and give and take back and forth really, really beautifully. And all of these old presumptions that I had when I first came into the ashram and I was a monk, all these presumptions about diksha and the way it worked and the guru and all these things, they completely evaporated over time. Yogananda had five gurus. First, his father initiated him in Kriya Yoga. Second, his Sanskrit tutor initiated him in Kriya Yoga, and that was a very, very deep initiation. Very, very personal and very, very dear. Third, Swami Sri Yukteswar initiated him again into Kriya Yoga. And he said very clearly, Yukteswar was my guru by proxy. He did not consider Yukteswar to be his true guru. He was his guru by proxy. He said that Babaji is my true guru. And later he said, Lahiri Mashaya is my astral guru. That is five gurus. So the idea that you're going to have just one source and you must absolutely stay completely dedicated to it is a Western religious idea. And Yogananda himself proves that through his life. It was not so much that I left Yogananda, but that I definitely left the organization that was representing him. I was in the ashram and they would tell me all the time, this is not master's way. This is not master's way. This is not master's way. And when you hear that, 1,000 times, and I'm not joking, I, I heard it so many times, you begin to kind of like figure things out, you know, and I finally realized this is an authoritarian logical fallacy 
because if I lined up 10 monks, I would have 10 different descriptions of what is master's way. They were using it when they should have said, you know what, I don't agree with what you're doing, and this is what I think based on my life of trying to live this life. But they didn't say that because they wanted to be humble. So why should I put myself forward, right? And so they put an authority forward and they said, this is not master's way. And I heard that so many times. I knew as soon as I heard that, that it wasn't true. It's a logical fallacy because they all had a different representation of what that meant. So it was not one thing, it was everything. Anything that they decided they didn't agree with was suddenly not master's way. So it wasn't that I left Yogananda so much as I left that because I, it, it was not true. And it wasn't true to my life. It was time for me to leave, right? A bunch of the monks, a bunch of my friends, we all knew that the Kriya had been changed. We knew that in the development of the lessons that we had received, that there were at least 10 different versions of the Kriya lessons. I believe it's closer to 15. If I remember correctly, there's a friend of mine that knows exactly how many versions there are, but safe to say it's at least 10 and it's more like 15. So in their own literature, the Kriya, which I was told over and over again, it must remain pure, it must re remain pure. It had never remained pure. And that kind of flabbergasted us when we realized that. So a bunch of us were really, we really wanted, could, could, we, could we know what the original version is? And some people found some things and they said, this is the original version. Turned out it was not the original version. Diving into the writings of Lahiri Mashaya, the writings to his students that his own family had published. If the Kriya Yoga does not have Om Japa, then it is not correct. It is tamasic, leading to negative results. And I had made the Kriya that I was given, I had made it work. I had even found my way into a Samadhi. And yet I had so many negative results. And so along the way, we found out that the Panchanan Bhattacharya lineage had really preserved the Kriya more than anyone. And that was amazing. And then we found out that Ashok Singh was in America and I came to see him. I came to see Ashok and I really wasn't thinking of him as a guru. I really just wanted to get the original Kriya. And that was a little bit in my mind, and he actually read my mind the first time I saw him, and so beautifully, he said to me, my only job is to get you in front of the true guru. When you can rise up into the medulla, he's talking about a roll-up of consciousness into the brain, right? So we free the consciousness from attachment, from the lower concerns, and we rise up and we come into the area of the medulla. And he says, that's where we Google God. When you can do that, my job is done. You are then in front of the true guru. So many yogis will talk about sitting at the feet of the guru. And certainly we can sit in front of somebody that can teach us and thank goodness that they can teach us something, right? And that in itself is beautiful, but the deeper and the hidden meaning is that experience which he was pointing at from the first day that I met him. He said, when you can Google God, when you get in front of the medulla, when you rise up into the brain, when you have a roll up of consciousness into the brain and the body has dimmed away from your awareness, then you are at the feet of the true guru. That is sitting at the feet of the guru. It is not an external experience. And so the Buddhists have this wonderful, it's actually a book. If you see the Buddha on the road, kill him. Oh my God, it sounds so horrific, right? But they're trying to show you something by making it very graphic. Blow up your mind and understand that if you think the true guru is outside, well then we have missed the entire point of the practice, all of yoga, of all the philosophies 
is designed to remove the middleman. I'm not going to any more middleman. I've gone through all these layers of philosophy when somebody else was telling it to me. I'm done with that. I have to experience it for myself. I will turn myself into the laboratory. I will run the experiment. I'm going to do it so I can receive the answer directly. And that only happens in the roll-up of consciousness. So, I mean, I'd been in front of so many wonderful people, so many deep, profound people, so many spiritual people, and sometimes they, were, they knew what they had, and it was, you know, they were full of it. And maybe rightfully so. But finally, I was in front of somebody they could put all that aside and say, look, my only job is to get you in front of the true guru inside of you. It blew me away. The amount of true humility that takes, right? He had it. He absolutely had it. It blew me away. And so he kept blowing me away in this way. I watched other students come and go, and they didn't really pay attention. They didn't really listen. But I had already encountered a lot of my right brain, right? So I, I was going into silence now and then. It wasn't as consistent as I wanted it, but I had some very deep and profound experiences. And as a result of that, when I encountered something that I needed to know, then the higher self would alert me and my whole body, I'd get goosebumps over my whole body. My hair would feel as if it was beginning to stand on end, like hair on fire, you know? And I would zero in to what somebody was telling me. And when I was with Ashok, this would happen again and again. So he would talk to me about the long breathing and I knew this is humongous. He would talk to me about the medulla, and I knew this is humongous. And this happened again and again and again. And my, my idea of Ashok's place in my life, well, he started to mean everything to me, as he should, as he should, because he gave me the way. He always, always pointed me in the right direction. Bit by bit, Yogananda, I still use his philosophy. I still use a lot of everything that he had put together. And it wasn't just him. It was Gyanamata. It was the writings of Dhirananda, which formed most of what is in the lessons. It was all these people that had devoted themselves. And that core philosophy, which I had studied, it, it stays with me to this day. I still quote it. I'll be talking to somebody and the quote, the perfect quote to answer will come from Yogananda will come from Dear Ananda, will come from that lifetime of study that I invested in it. So Yogananda, bit by bit, he became this uncle-like voice in my head that is there to chime in. So people come to me and they tell me that Yogananda is their guru. They just want to train Kriya and I'm totally okay with that because that's how I came to Ashok. And sometimes they feel like they have to justify this training with me, which I understand. It's a process, it's an internal soul searching. Like Babaji said, each one must do their own soul searching. So I understand that. But I had a wonderful experience very recently. Somebody has been pushing, pushing, pushing in their meditations and it's been causing havoc in their meditative life, it, it doesn't work. Long term, it causes a lot of problems, right? And so they're learning to pull back, they're learning to let go, and I've been training them in all of this, tr been training them in the Om Japa, in the chakras, training them in each of these things. And they came back to me and they said, you know, this is here and in the, in the lineage that I was in, and this was here, and this was here, and everything that you are saying, it's very much aligning. That is exactly right. And they're just not accentuating everything in the way that I am accentuating everything. And they're sometimes leading down a blind alley and not necessarily because of the teacher, but because of those who are holding the teachings who are not emphasizing the same things in the same way. When someone shows you the way to a deep and profound experience, you start to realize, 
what a treasure they are. And I came to this place, I was living up in Washington, and I just had download after download. So I had, I was coming up into the area of the brain, right? And I was getting very, very, very close to the non-dual state. And when that happens, you start getting a lot of downloads and it was happening again and again and again. And all these epiphanies were happening and they were happening so quickly that the earth seemed to be shifting under my feet on a daily and sometimes an hourly basis. And I just thought, Oh my God, how lucky am I to have found this pure lineage of Kriya Yoga. And I am overwhelmingly in love with all of it. Around this time, I had a Samadhi and I wrote to Ashok, I said, this happened and this happened and this happened. And he confirmed it for me. He said, yes, that is a Samadhi. And he said so simply to me, now you are where I am. And that's all I ever needed to hear. Outwardly, we can be very, very concerned about the politics of a lineage, the politics of our church, the politics of people. Inwardly, the story of the Guru is very, very simple. It is something that happens inside of you. It's never happening outside of you. That's just the rest of the story the true story is always within. So I hope that you loved this. If you did, be sure to hit that bell down below so I can see all of you next time.